four, 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 four. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to the EG Pot Thunder with Chuck Boy, the young, light skin, Keith Sweat. And to the left, my guy, Andy, all the way coming from L.A. to make a special guest appearance on the pod. Thank you for coming through, my guy. Of course, man. Appreciate you having me, bro. Yeah, man, for sure. Do you want to give a little introduction to what you do, like your job title? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, a sports editor, sports writer for uh, Yahoo Sports. So I cover a little bit of everything. Um, I mostly write about soccer, but I cover all types of sports, editorial stuff, and making sure that our website looks good and our content gets out there and our content is clean and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a pretty cool gig, man. That's pretty dope. I can definitely say you're the first person that has been on the pod that has that job. So I'm going to have a million questions for you. <laughs> dope, dope. Um, when I asked you yesterday to be on, I just had to shut up because I'm like, you know what? I'm going to ruin my surprises. I want to all be genuine when I find out the information. But um, first of all, bro, that's, that's, that's what's up, bro, because a lot of people, like especially being from a small state such as Rhode Island, they don't have like that. They think it's like far-fetched that that could ever be like your actual job title. They think, oh, that must be cool that, you know, Adrian Wolofsky and stuff like that. That's their job, Adam Scheffler and stuff like that. But it is obtainable from Rhode Island. But, like, How do you think you had that mindset growing up in such a small state? Did that ever like deter you from being in that field? Yeah, it's interesting because it is like a, I feel like it's a field that a lot of people would like to work in. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a different type of job. So, you know, it's when you work with sports, obviously, a lot of us grow up being sports fans and we're like, oh, we would like to do this. And we see all these people doing it. But I think it's just about the way you approach it. Um, I didn't go to school in state. Like after I graduated high school, I went to school in Boston. So I definitely think that helped a lot in terms of where I was exposure to sports, because at that time, you know, every Boston sports team was winning. So it was just a cool time to be around. And get exposure, grab internships, um, co- co-ops, things like that, that kind of just like got my feet wet in the field. And I was just really active. That's the thing. Like I always tell people it might not be an easy thing to get into, but if you're passionate about it, dedicated to it, um, do it. I, I, get, I de- dedicate a lot of time to it, holidays, weekends, and things like that. And I still do because, you know, it's sports a lot of times that's, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop at all. Dude, so. Like Stephen A, this guy is working <laughs> all day, yeah, yeah. every day. Does this guy sleep? Does he take a nap? Uh, I can't. I can't confirm nor deny that. I've seen him play <laughs> times because I used to work at ESPN for a little bit, but um, I haven't seen him sleep. <laughs> Dude, he goes from one thing to another thing to another thing, and. It's draining, yeah. like especially having the podcast. Like people are like, oh, that's pretty dope. But dude, like having people on guests, content creation, getting out, being entertaining, being behind the camera, setting up behind the camera, knowing what you're talking about, delivering it well, that is not easy. No, nah, no, nah, it's not. And I think it's it's one of those things. Like the more you do it, obviously, like anything, you get the reps in and, and you get better at it. But um, it's about being unique too, because you have to be your own person in the field like that. Because I tell people all the time, you know, everybody watches the same game and. Everybody could have the same opinion or have different opinions, but it's about how you deliver it, how you're, you know, building yourself up and things like that. So I think that's the most important thing when it comes to, you know, just pre- present presentation and, and, and delivering your message. Because, like I said, it's it's one game, but it could be a thousand different perspectives. It's the way, yeah. all about the way you see it. Yeah, you never know who's watching, but just to get even started back in the day. So when you were younger, was that always on your mind? I want to get back to, like, day one, like, middle school, high school. Was that always part of the plan? Like, no matter what, I'm finding a way to get into this field or did it spring up during college? Nah, I always tell people it's a funny story because, like, the reason I did it is because I was so lazy as a student (laughs) and I didn't know what I wanted to major in when I got to college. And I was like, yo, I just knew that there were certain things that I didn't like, like math and, and numbers and stuff like that. So it was like a process of elimination uh, back in the day, I don't know if it still exists. There was a website that you could like put your interests, and it kind of like spits out like majors and stuff like that. Oh, um, I, I did not know about that. Website. Yeah, so I did that, and I, I had like one teacher in high school told me I was like a decent writer, which kind of like it was stuck in the back of my mind. Um, and I did enjoy reading, just like obviously in high school you're reading about stuff you don't care about. But I was always like a, a big reader of sports, um, media, sports journalism. So it was a process of elimination. I was like, hey, this popped up, and I was like. Sure, why not? It sounds like it could be fun. I never thought it would get to the point that it has. Wait, so what popped up? Like, it popped up. Journalism was like, 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 this was like what you should do. Like, basically, this is a major that seems to like follow your interests and stuff like that. So once that comes up, what's the next stage after that? Because like I said, this is taboo to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they don't. Like I said, the thing is far fetched, especially being from you know such a small state of Rhode Island. Far fetched for anywhere. Never mind, especially being from Rhode Island. So sure. after that came up, what was the next step like in the journey? Yeah, I was like, I right, well, I knew I wanted to go to school in Boston. That was the number one thing. So I think that was it was good that I had my mindset that way. Um, and I was just like applying to places and and trying to figure that out. Once I got accepted, I went to a school called Suffolk uh, Suffolk University in downtown Boston. 
once I got accepted, it was it was um how like do I start this? Because I it was journalism is journalism, but I wanted to do sports obviously. So I was like I needed to find a balance. And luckily, at at my school and like a lot of schools, they have those student newspapers, um, st- online outlets like our online newspaper. So I hit the ground running. I I'll never forget. I was like I went to you know I I wrote for the student newspaper first, um, and I didn't really necessarily like the way they were running their thing. Um, their group so I went to the online publication and it was a lot more it was a lot more freedom and that was actually a good test to be like yo this is what the industry is like like newspapers are very particular like actual print newspapers there's like too much like yeah it's just control we need you to do the story we need you to um, have like a word count you can't write more than 350 words and then later down the road I, I would get into that in a professional way and it helped me is probably the best experience I've gotten but at that time since I was so new I was like nah this is not good for me I need to like start writing and get those like that journalism experience do you so think if you stayed there journey. would that have like um no i think it would have been fine because i think it, it is it was really cool because you they would print the newspaper and it would be all over campus so i think it, it, the experience would have been dope i just think that because i made that switch to the online publication i was able to have freedom and do what i wanted and the first story i wrote was like a, 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 a album review it was the jay-z blueprint uh three album review and i was like i don't know who the hell let me write this i'm a huge jay-z fan and i was Dude, like, that was... bias and shit but i'm like <laughs> you know what i mean like whatever i'm gonna do it anyway and that's then... on the schedule for the, this podcast yeah, like talking about bad, uh bad. jay-z and kanye yes, but um so that so what online publication was it i mean i don't know if you can say it or not or if you just... yeah no it's just like an online like newspaper basically we just we just like to call it a newspaper because it's not print but it's just um it's called the suffolk voice um I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're still running uh, now, because it was a pretty big group when I was there, and I made it a point to make sure that that group was, you know, popping, obviously, because I was, I'm going to dedicate four years of undergrad to this, and I so wanted to be known. Do you just reach out and they take anybody in, or do you have to be certain qualifications yeah. to be in that Suffolk uh, online nah, publication? It was like, it was like, hey, I'm interested to come to the first meeting and see what it's about, and it was, the meetings were pretty cool, man. It was just the editors would sit in the front of the room and be like, all right, I'm the sports editor, I'm the A&E editor, I'm the news editor, like, these are the stories that we think that we would like somebody to write. But do y'all have any ideas? And I was like, yeah, sure. So at that point, are you just want to get the ground running? You're just getting yeah. the like, experience? Do you even care about people reading like the viewership or anything nah. like that? It was more like just... Yeah, it was just the experience because I was so it was so new to me because I had never done it before. And I'm like, I know writing is one thing, but writing as a journalist is, is a completely different ballgame. So I was like, yeah, I needed to like get this experience and like really, you know, go through it um, in certain ways, deadlines and things like that, or just challenging myself to do stories that I didn't necessarily want to do. Um, but I did have a lot of freedom when I did start writing sports. Like they were like, "Yo, like, hit the ground running and do what you want." And I was one of the most active writers like throughout the whole four years, which I thought was pretty dope. Are you just continually doing like daily stories as a weekly? Man, I did everything. I started a blog for the website. I was doing um, weekly NFL predictions, which was hilarious. I have a funny story about that. We had a we had like a little office in in our building, and one day the phone started ringing. I didn't even know there was a phone in that office, and I'm like, "Who the hell?" So like I answered it, and they were like, "Hey, like." We're calling. We're trying to uh, know when the predictions are gonna get posted because, <laughs> like, we're trying to like bet or something like that. And at this time in 2010, betting wasn't as crazy as it is now. And I was like, "Yeah, that's wild." Like, somebody's really waiting for my story. And I'm like, it's a college kid that like, yeah. loves the NFL and is writing this shit on the side. So it was cool because it, it realized like the internet is so powerful. And and like you bring up a good point about like if I stay at the paper, would I have had that exposure? Maybe not because the internet like just boosts everything. So it was it was pretty dope. Yeah, I mean. Who's, I mean, I I don't ever pick up a newspaper. Nah, so I think it's just more like online. Like even yesterday at that event we were at, we met some uh, some kid, like Henry is his name. And uh, I was just intrigued. I'm like, how'd you find out about the right. event? He's like, found it on Instagram. Right, right. The power of the internet. You never know who's watching. You never right. know who's looking at you. Yeah. Whose life you can you know impact. Who's waiting to bet <laughs> on your on your article? It's actually crazy because someone actually reached out to me this, uh, this past week. And they're like, hey, they're interested in the show and stuff like that. They're like, oh, you should do like a betting show. Mm. And I'm like, should I? Right. I mean, because I don't bet. Right. I don't yeah. bet at stay all. Away but from that. I stay <laughs> away from it. I had a crazy story like in 2014, Pats are opening up against the Titans. I don't even like the Pats, but I'm not an idiot. They were given six. Right. And I'm like, oh, this bet's too layup. easy. Just a layup. <laughs> 500 bucks won. Next week, bet like seven games, lost every single one. Yeah, 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 now I'm like, never again. So, yeah, but the power of betting, you never know like who's into it and stuff like that so did you pump out that story like right away so the guy can yeah, put his best yeah. in and the thing is i was working on it so it was funny that i was a the one that answered the phone and b he was like looking for my story and i was like it was it was like a it was cool because it taught me responsibility of like yo this needs to be a, a weekly thing like obviously i can't just do it a few weeks and then be like all right cool i'm done with yeah it. and it was like a weekly thing with the picks um just like my thoughts on the games and and i was like 
it was good because it was keeping me accountable of like writing that, but also like, all right, what else do I write? I can't just have one story to be my thing. So it was dope because it became like my little project for the seasons and it was, it was cool. Do you think like, at least in publication and uh, journalism, is it best to find a niche or is it best to be everywhere? Like, yeah, that's, that's a good question, man. I, cause I feel like when I started, I really was everywhere. Like I, like the following year I, I was in the hockey beat. So I like ended up covering the Bruins the year they won the Stanley cup. Um, and I was like all hands down on that. So it was weird. Cause I really did like hop around, but for me, I think it, I think it's beneficial because it shows that versatility. Like mm -hmm. we could all say, oh, we are experts at one thing or we're like fans of more than one sport. But I think the more you know, it's it's only going to help you down the road. And I look at it now, like my job now is very specific. When I write, it's very specific to soccer. But like I said, I work with a lot of other sports. So just knowing different things, obviously, is always going to help. You know, but definitely like it's even with the podcast, I love having a variety of guests. Yeah. I don't just like doing one thing because first off, I'm genuinely interested in people's stories. Right. And if people like the podcast, they must be liking what I'm doing. So right. I think if they like what I'm doing, they're going to like the guests I'm kind of ha having on. For because, sure. you know, like you said, I think it's the best. Like, you got, I can be funny, mm -hmm. serious, businesses, athletes. You never know who's watching. I Like I said, I just want to keep it going. And you never know. You never know what hits with people. That's a fact. Yeah. And, uh, so with the publication, are you getting paid? Or is that strictly an internship? Nah. So it's basically like an extracurricular activity on campus um, that, that, you know, people participate in that because they want to, obviously, or because they're looking to get into the field. But like I mentioned, the, the Bruins thing was dope because we were the only sports, um, college sports like paper that had a press pass to home games. Mm. So we were like, I was at the arena at the TD Garden, like that whole season covering the Bruins in the locker room. And, you know, all. so I was like, oh, like as a as a young college student, I'm like, this is a dope experience that's free. You know what I mean? Like this that's is something crazy. I'm getting like a extracurricular thing. And it just happened to be there. They won the Stanley cup. So it went really far into the year, you know, being in the same press box, um, press box and locker rooms as all of these journalists that I've, I've read in Boston and things like that. So I was like, it was dope. It, it that didn't, I didn't get any money from that, but that I think led to the next thing, which kept the career going. Yeah, sometimes you have to sacrifice for sure. money just for networking, meeting people, getting that experience that you can never have anywhere else. Most definitely. I mean, if you, say if you can get it paid for just doing the random Joe Schmo event, who are you meeting there, though? Right. I think you know networking is key. I tell young athletes who come on the podcast all the time, especially when they're going to college, you, you got to network. You never know where or who you're going to meet. If they're having those random events on campus, go to them. Yeah. Even people are going to laugh at you. Like, oh, you're going to that? Come on, bro. We should be going back to Rhode Island, hanging out, going to Fed Hill or something like that. It's like, bro, you're more beneficial to like expand your career and your horizon if you're going to these networking events. Absolutely. Bro. And do you think like so when you're there, are you, you know, are you networking with general yeah. journalists is that you're trying to get like your name out there is networking key yeah. in the journalism world? No, nah, most definitely. I think because it's so I think it's so linear, right? People say like I journalism, you're you you write and that's what it is, but it's like you also have to realize there's podcasts, there's radio hits, there's video stuff. Like the more you speak to people, the more you kind of just open those doors and like, hey, I'm willing to hop on or willing to collab with something like it's only going to help in the long run. So I, I started doing that early and I still do it to the day, man. Yeah, man. You're coming through right here. You're ready to know. that love. <laughs> and um, because that's the thing too, like even when like Adrian Wolowski and Adam Scheffler is like, how do you think they're getting these insider information leaks? Because yeah. they are networking. They are networking their ass off. You know, they're not just hitting them up for no reason. Even the Iron Rap reports, all of them. You know, everyone knows those big insider guys. They're doing it, they're doing it from day one. Yeah. I mean, those connections they have is crazy. Absolutely, yeah. It's about that too, man. You gotta, you gotta just be a, a genuine person in the field, and and the more people you know, obviously, when you're at a certain level, like it's only gonna keep up with you because people will give you those scoops. People will feel comfortable giving you that news. So, I think it's important. You kind of ask about like the one field, like if you do have that one field, like really stick down to that. If you're gonna, that's your plan, then you know, be that person. Be that person that like, hey, I want to be known for credibility and for being honest and you know things like that and i think it always helps yeah i mean he's talking about credibility just instantly popped in my head how do you feel about the ball sack sports you think it's just uh <laughs> man you people in your journalism world how do you guys feel about them is it like comedy or it's kind of funny or do yeah. you guys get like piss off when you see that type of stuff yeah i mean i i mean i find it funny because i don't i don't take it like so seriously but you know there's obviously people that are going to see it different ways um i think you know people just the internet, like I mentioned, man, the internet is so open that you're gonna see a lot of different things. But you gotta, you gotta really be your own person, as which I said earlier. You have to kind of just stand out in your own way, and almost as a way of like selling yourself. As, as weird as that sounds, but yeah. like really just being your own person because it's all about building that voice and then building that audience. When you got two a unique voice and then you have your audience, 
you're not you're gonna nobody's gonna stop you yeah no for sure i definitely agree with that uh someone reached out to me recently too they're like hey we would like to collab like maybe you can come on the network and stuff like that but because i have like i said that funny ones but girls come on yeah. start going crazy <laughs> and the guy's like but you gotta you gotta tone it down i'm like bro you reach out to me right, right, right. this is who i am i'm doing this for my genuine interest i'm not gonna change for someone who i don't even know i don't even care if it comes with money yeah because i'm gonna stay true to myself and be my own identity i'm not gonna just conform this to you because you want to do it and profit off me yeah. i'm not an idiot i know what you're trying to do sure. you're not reaching out to me for no reason but um, yeah, just staying true to yourself. So when you're there, the Suffolk University with the Bruins, did you make any connections there? What was the next step after that um, yeah. step in your journey? Nah, it was crazy because like I mentioned, I'm in these press boxes with like, with, you know, local journalists that I've read just as a fan of these sports of whatever um, in Boston. So I, I networked a lot there. And, and it's funny because I had that Bruins experience. I ended up getting my first internship at uh, Nesson. That was the, the season after they won the Stanley Cup. Uh, so that was dope because it was my first internship. It was obviously a, a big deal. Nesson is still a big deal um, in New England. So I was there for three months. It was like a quick little internship, but that helped with uh, credits for my for my you know curriculum or whatever in, in school. So I I only took like I think a few classes that year or that semester rather. So that was dope, and it was once again getting professional experience in a different way. Um, I did some writing and I also did some video stuff for them. Um, so it was dope. It was super super cool. I enjoyed it a lot. And then, like I said, things just keep progressing. That led to the next thing. And th another funny story there is that, like, the kid I was really working with um, remotely at Nesson, I ended up working with him at ESPN later down dope. the road. And I was like, yo, this is crazy how small the world is. But Yeah, you never know. It really isn't that small when you're in, in a field like that. So it's pretty cool. So just a like, step back right here. So when you're doing the online publication, do you think that's, like, the road? Like, so if someone interested in watching this far into the podcast, what would you say – is like the proper channel to get into journalism and get to Nesson and get to Bruins. Is that the only way or is there different other ways or this is the way you recommend? Yeah. I mean, it, like I said, it depends what you want to do because if you really want to do the writing, then sh yeah, the only way for me is start writing, write for a publication, write for a newspaper, um, freelance. Obviously a lot of people kind of feel indifferent about that because it's a lot of time and, and maybe not money invested. But like you mentioned in the beginning, it, it's not going to be about money. It's, and it's a field that traditionally doesn't really pay that well. So people, would always be on my neck about that and i'm like it's not really i'm not thinking about that right now i'm just thinking about like getting started and getting put on so yeah i would definitely recommend that and if not like if you're not trying to do the right thing but you're still trying to do like a in a broadcast sense stuff like this do podcasts get your reels um you know radio i used to do a radio show in college as well that i kind of tied in with my writing so just those getting those reps in and whatever kind of like media sense if this is what you something you want to do is is i think the only way to start and go about it and then are you making like a, like a highlight tape and sending it off to like yeah. Nesson and ESPN? Is that coming to your story down the road? So for me, it didn't because I never did any um, in front of the camera stuff, really. I was more behind the scenes, but I did with the writing. I did have like a, I created my own little website that was kind of like an online portfolio instead of just like sending links around. I okay. kind of just linked all the work in this website and I had it. So whenever I did my interviews, I had that to show like, hey, this is like a catalog of things I've written. You know, I, I format it the way I want. Obviously, my favorite best stories I'll put up first. So that was pretty dope. It's just essentially is like your highlight tape. Yeah, so yeah, but, are you yeah. reaching out like so you're basically booking interviews? You're not just sending off your website to random. You're not sending emails. Yeah, just like check my link up. Yeah, check my mixtape. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> like high school kids, like, <laughs> like Josh Allen, like right. emailing a bunch of coaches. You're not doing that. Yet. It's all now you're applying to jobs. Yeah, when you start taking it serious. Exactly, exactly. And it, it was like it's pretty weird for me because it's it, it kind of just all happened so quickly, dog. Like I I didn't really like have to. Luckily, I didn't really have to like stress out about trying to get a job. Like I, w I applied to the uh, Nesson internship. I got that. That when next that was I went at the Boston Globe. I applied for that, got that, and it was just like things just fell into place. And with those experiences, you start learning so much about yourself, about your skills, and, and you know you keep growing as a journalist or as a as a worker. And that it was just amazing how things just progressed like super quickly. But th I'm thankful for that, man, for sure. Yeah, that's definitely what's up. So I, at Nesson and the Boston Globe, are you doing the same job? Nah, the Boston Globe was. I still say it to now, I think hands down the best year I've had in my career. Like it was, it was the coolest thing ever. So that was a co-op and that means- What's like, a co-op? A co-op is like a, like a better version of an internship, like where they're going to, instead of you going to class, like you're just going to work. So mm -hmm. I literally took, I think two courses that whole year and the rest of it was credits for my, uh, you know, for my curriculum. And it was just amazing at like the exposure. Um, it was, it was, so I was basically a, a high school sports reporter. And as, as the co-op, I had more responsibilities than the people that were there like working part-time because that that's what it was about, gaining you that, um, that experience, the opportunities. 
And man, it was it was the best it was the best year I had. I was all over the state of Massachusetts, uh, Friday Saturdays covering all types of games. I mean, I started just doing football because it was football season, and you know, high school football is pretty dope. It's a, it's a cool experience to go to these games and talk to these kids and oh, players. Sure. The only chat, well, not the only challenge, but one of the biggest challenges is like you have to take the stats down on your own. So you got to be like locked in. I'm on these sidelines. A lot of the stadiums don't even got press boxes, so I'm on the sidelines like running around, like making sure I got, you know, I'm marking things down the right way. But it taught me a lot about the field because, like I mentioned about the newspapers, it's very traditional. So you have deadlines because they have to print things. You have word counts because they have space, you know, uh, requirements. So you have to... It comes full circle. Yeah, it comes moment. super full circle. And you got to be, like, on top of everything. Like, our thing, it, it, our running joke is, like, we would go to a game and then we would run to the closest McDonald's because McDonald's has free Wi-Fi <laughs> and it's pretty reliable. So a lot of times we would be filing, writing in McDonald's and filing our story while like kids are walking in to celebrate whatever game. So yeah, because you got to have it for the post wrap up have for it quick, man. For, like they're a sports fast. wrap essentially. Yeah. I got new, I got exactly. about 1045 or Rhode Island yeah. they do it. Yeah. So out of curiosity for me, so why you said you did your own podcast and like radio, well, radio show you said, right? Not a podcast. Yeah, so yeah. it was just strictly it's audio. Radio. Yeah, it was a radio show. It was part of, it was like another extracurricular activity um, at Suffolk, uh, Suffolk Free Radio. But it was dope because the radio station was right across from our office. And I was like, yo, this is cool. Like, I could just do this and talk about sports while I'm writing about sports. So I just grabbed my roommate. I'm like, are we going to do a radio show? Like, and it was dope. Like, people enjoyed it. Like, we, you know, chopped it up. Yeah, it's always cool. Like, I'm sure you've gotten this too. Like, random people will just be like, bro, I listen to your show. That's just dope. And I'm like, yeah. Oh damn! You listen? Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's what that's what's up. I didn't even know. For sure. You don't know. Yes, it says the view count. But you don't know who it is. Yeah, yeah. But um, all point that bringing it, bringing that up was because why were you more on the journalism side as opposed to like the the Stephen A. the yeah. personality side? That never intrigued you? Nah, I thought it was pretty dope. Like I liked it when I started doing like the radio and, and like the interviews and shit like that. I was like, oh, this is kind of fire. Like I could see why people love doing this. I just never. I just never like skewed from. Actually, I lied. When I started, when I started um, at Suffolk, I was a broadcast journalism major, so I had to take these classes for broadcast, like TV stuff. And that's when I realized, like, yo, this shit is a lot harder than it seems. Oh, hundred percent. And I had to go to. This is actually I completely forgot about this. This is the reason why I stayed writing, because I went to a job shadow opportunity with a reporter from um, NECN, that's like the, the news, one of the news uh, stations out in Boston, and it was like St. Patrick's Day week. Everybody in Boston was on St. Patrick's mm -hmm. Day. So I'm like already like kind of like, why the fuck am I doing this at this time, you know? So I I went to the job shadow with him and he was like, yo, we're going to work on this story that was about like a light fixture in like one of the tunnels. And he's like, the first day we're going to go on the field and do the interviews and then the second day we're going to put it together. So I'm with this dude all day and I'm like, yo, this shit is boring. Like he's <laughs> going to like, like transportation meetings and I'm like, I, I just, I want to see the process, right? Yeah. Bro, he spent all day on the field like, ate lunch out of like a 7-Eleven or some weird shit like that. <laughs> he did all this work and like I watched this segment on the news and it was like a minute long and I'm like, bro, you spent all that time for a minute on TV? That's wild. And I was like, yo, this is crazy. Like this is a whole different ball game. So then I was kind of just like turned off by like the TV side of it and then I took some of those broadcasting class and I was like, oh, this is the this is it. Like this confirmed it. <laughs> I had a professor who was wild trash. And he Wait, was what like, confirmed it? So what so already that 7 Eleven. Yeah, that, that 7 Eleven lunch, lunch was in there. No, no, you want no sushi from 7 Eleven, nah, not on the bro. menu. No but sir. then what was on the broadcast and what confirmed it the most in that My class? My professor, he ruined, he ruined any dream I had about ever being on TV. Not explain, but he was he was <laughs> terrible though. He was like one of the professors would be like, Oh, this is like a news, like basically is a news position. So I have the right to quiz you about like pop culture stuff randomly and i'm like bro i'm not here for this shit this is not like a pop quiz about what like fuck? what's going on in england and shit like bro i don't know what the fuck's going on over there i'm trying to you know i'm trying to talk about the celtics and the bruins and shit so it was like nah he was all over the place and it was it was a good class to learn different things about like how um you know broadcast works and being in front and behind the camera because behind the camera i think is as impressive as being in front of it it takes a lot of time when you when you're doing stuff like that broadcast journalism but it, all in all i was like i'm glad i did the job shadow and i'm and i'm kind of i had that experience and i was like nah I, I think i could do the print and I'm, I'm a little more about it because i had already started writing yeah so i was like i kind of like this a lot more because i have all creative freedom around it whereas like tv and stuff is, is very lined up so you have to you know sometimes you have to follow certain guidelines or talk about certain things and it's like nah, yeah, especially at that time like, that was before the pat mcafee's of the world yeah. doing his own thing right right that was before like podcasts are blowing up not like rogan and things people just do whatever they want Facts. you know on espn i'm sure it's regimented you cannot say this you can't say that 
you probably can't talk about this topic. Yeah. They're probably pushing topics on you. I yeah. forget who I uh, listened to. Oh, it was actually Paul Pierce. He was talking about how when he was at ESPN, they were saying that, you know, there's pushing. You got to talk about LeBron. You got to talk yeah, about yeah, LeBron. Yeah. You got to talk about LeBron. It's an agenda. It's an yeah. agenda, man. Yeah. That's why, you know, Skip, mm-hmm. this guy's never even got responded to by LeBron, but he won't drop it. He won't. He won't Every day it's LeBron. It's like, dude, <laughs> watch. But, I mean, it brings in viewers. Yeah. I mean, so I'm sure, like you said, there's agendas for, like, broadcasts and stuff like that. But it's definitely not easy. You know, I've had people on, and I could tell they were, like, nervous beforehand. Then I've had people say they're going to come on, and then they cancel, something happens. And I'm not, people get nervous. I know yeah. what it is. They get the light in front of them. It's completely different. For sure. You know, just talking with your friends. And even podcasting is different than, like, broadcasting, too. Because I would do, like, live streams of Dolphin games. And I did it once, by my, I've done a couple times with myself. And it's completely different talking by yourself, just watching a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is so much more difficult not having someone to bounce off right, back on. Right. And I'm like, I remember uh, at one point, like a whole bunch of people came on, like 500 people came on at one time. And I forgot I was watching the game. And then the comments are like, dude, why isn't this guy talking? And I'm like, oh shit. Like, I, I forgot they came to watch me. I need to be entertained. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's difficult. And like, no one wants to hear, like, okay, third and 10, here's the next play, right, right. two against sacked, okay, next play. People want entertainment because they can watch the game for that shit. Yeah, and I think that's why you see things do so well now, like that Manning cast, and, like, oh. they've done it for college football a lot of times. Like, it's cool because, yeah, like, anybody could traditionally watch the game and have their own opinion and have their own thoughts, but it's, like, to hear two legends like that that really know the game just talk about it and make jokes at the same time is, is dope. I think that's why it's dope. Cool. It's difficult yeah. to be entertaining, to be informative. Sure. How do you, do you like the Manning Castle? I lot? love it. I hated it in the beginning. I was like, this is a bad <laughs> idea. And like after like two weeks, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Now, oh, I, so even, I never want to watch it again on a regular broadcast. Like I need them to be on all the time. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, there's teams, like, t- tomorrow, when we're filming this, tomorrow is going to be the Cardinals and Patriots. Mm-hmm. Got to be probably a shitty game. Facts. But I'm like, I am watching this <laughs> yeah. because it's Eli and Peyton. For I don't sure. care. I will literally go out of my way to watch any broadcaster on. Yeah, no, nah, no. Nah, it's, it's dope. It's, it, I, I thought it was a, a pretty good idea. And then it, I think my thing about them was, like, these two guys seem like they have, like, weird and boring personalities but they're both funny as hell though. Like, <laughs> they're, both, they're both hilarious and i'm like it, that, this, yeah. this makes so much sense like it's so practical but it makes so much sense yeah that brother dynamic with them is yeah. it's, it's incredible but they're great. they don't reuse jokes they're always nah, funny nah. <laughs> eli i think has skyrocketed from yeah. like i think probably people thought he's like the most boring person yep, on earth and yep. now he's literally the man he's the man he's exactly. literally the man i think he is so funny for sure yeah so at the uh the boston globe What's, what was the next step after that? Yeah, so Boston Globe, it turned from like six months to a year. Like once I finished my co-op, which was six months, they kept me on as a part-time employee. So that was cool because then I was like actually getting paid. Like I was like, I mean, it wasn't a lot. But at that time, I'm like, yeah, this is dope. I'm getting paid to cover sports. So you weren't even getting paid at all. So you're going nah. on these Friday, Saturday games yeah. for high school football, basketball, I'm assuming, after the next sport. Yep, yep. So you're going to, that's all you, like yep. your gas money. No, the good thing is we had, um, yeah, it was my gas money. But the good thing is that we had uh, some cars, we call them Globe cars, uh, that they we could rent not really rent out but just use them but them things was terrible i think i used one like two of them and i was like nah you know what i just rather drive around and waste my own gas <laughs> well you might get stuck in the side of the road yeah bro and then you're like stressed because you're not gonna get the story in on time like nah, <laughs> nah i don't need them problems so yeah it was it was all on my own merit but like i said earlier about the credits like that was dope because i didn't even have to worry about school that year i was like bro i was on campus like i think i went to campus once a week and it was to be um, at the Suffolk voice meetings because I ended up being like a uh, like one of the lead editors like towards the end of my undergrad. Awesome. So I, I used to, you know, I used to be really involved with that. But besides that, I was never on campus, bro. Wait, so at that point, you fully transitioned to the journalism as your major. Yeah, yeah, I was in. I was print journalism, like full, full. And then like through the years, I started, you know, I started as a assistant sports editor, like my sophomore year. Then I became a sports editor. Then I became like the main editor. And then, you know, it just. So main editor, you're at Boston Globe right now. Yeah. You finally get paid. Yeah. So what's the next step after that? Now you're feeling good, probably. Like, oh, all right, sure. now I was feel like, now I'm, I'm here. Like I'm popping because like, you know, like Twitter's popping off at that time of the, you know, that time, 2010, like it's really like picking up steam and it changed the way sports are just perceived. So. I was very active there. The Globe did a really good job about having us like have that online presence and start the live tweeting of games um, and like retweeting us from like a, a pretty big like Boston Globe affiliated account. Yeah, of course. So we were getting you know a lot of exposure there. So I'm kind of learning how to build that avenue and and you know move forward. So I was like, now I'm here. I got experience professionally, um, both newspaper and with the Bruins. I have the internship. So. I was a wilding out, and that's when I was just sending applications everywhere, like, yo, check my mixtape out type thing. <laughs> but like I mentioned earlier, like things just fell in line. I applied to ESPN, which is like a pipe dream for a lot of people. And 
I got in, dog. Like I had an interview and I was at like, that point. You're probably like, yeah, I'm like, I'm Damn, like, yo, yeah, I made it. exactly. I made I'm it. like, and I'm this is fresh out of college. Like I was still in college when I was sending these applications out. Um, and I, yeah, I got an interview and I was like, dog, if I like let this opportunity slip, then you know, at least I went through the experience of, of getting to Bristol and having that, um, you know, that type of stuff, that exposure to whatever. So I went over there, man. It was one of the craziest interviews ever, bro. Like I was. I was out there um, like all day, and it was like it was for a program that was called. Oh shit! I already forgot the name of the program, but anyway, it was a program where for for the people that were applying, you were basically going to be like an internship rotation. So you were going to start in one role, and then the next after three months, they were going to change you to a different role of um, the the company. So for you to experience four different um, parts of the company, with the goal once you were over to to stick at one of those or whatever, you know, move on. So. Um, I applied for that. And the funny thing is I didn't even get that job. I just, it was like, that's what I was there applying for. But because it was such a long process, I was there, like I mentioned all day, I had to interview with a bunch of different people. So that's crazy. it was cool because the people that were involved were like, yo, you know, let's have him come in and do this. Let's have him interview for this position. And it's like, I right, word. This is my guy, Andy at ESPN right here <laughs> on the screen. Yeah, man. So, so it was, it was dope because I interviewed for a bunch of different spots. And then I just, that day I left like super confident about like, yo, I'm going to get one job because there's no way in hell I just talked to people like seven <laughs> hours in Bristol and I'm not going to land. So, saying, so you mean all these people. So what is like that? Are you nervous at that point? You're, you got the little jitters. You maybe? know what's funny? I was nervous about the job that I wanted, which was the, the rotational program. And I, I felt like I didn't have a good interview. And the other ones, I felt like I knocked them all out the park. Like every other one, I I think one of the dudes wanted to hire me like on the spot. And I was kind of just like, yo, like, wait, because I just spent a lot of time like interviewing with these people. Something else might come up. Um, but it helps me that I'm like, it's like super, I'm bilingual. So this guy was like, oh, we want to want to kind of have you like ESPN, but also ESPN Deportes, and he was like super about it. But at the end, another an, another opportunity ended up coming up in the company, and I was like, I'm gonna roll with that, man. So you're meeting like these are like executives. These aren't yeah. like on screen personalities. Nah, nah, these so are no one like, like you're new. Yeah, yeah. These are ex I mean, these are executives. Um, you know, just people in, in high places there. But um, yeah, it was it was wild, bro. It was that I I'll never forget that interview process. It was crazy. Do you have any like any uh, tips and tricks to people who are watching this? They got to be into journalism, so they're applying to ESPN. Do you have anything like do's don'ts for people? Yeah. Um, I would say like just be genuine because it was like I had a lot of interviews prior to getting to Bristol like let me not go over that because you have to obviously go through the process of phone interviews and stuff like that and even a few of those I was kind of just like I right, like maybe that wasn't the best you know they would ask me questions about who's your favorite writer and maybe like what's your favorite ESPN show and things like that so it's like just be genuine because people are gonna tell it if you lying if oh. you're like oh I like this show the show's not even on TV no more like you saying some <laughs> weird shit so I'm like I already knew like I, I I like as a sports fan you're a consumer so I already knew when they asked me stuff like who's your favorite writer I already had things like that in my in my head so definitely be genuine and and be honest because they'll ask you I ended up working with a lot of the apps in in my early time at ESPN so they ask you about the apps, and if you if you don't use them and you don't know, then it's better for you to say I haven't used it that much, or like I do know this, or I like this, instead of just lying about it, because they people are gonna read through you. Oh yeah, they're definitely gonna know. And did you ever see that clip? It's a uh, it went viral, obviously, when Stephen A. was talking about I think like the Chargers uh, injury report, and he's like, I can't wait for uh, <laughs> like. Like, even like right now, this today, like oh the Derwin James, he's yeah. gonna be going off tomorrow tonight against the Dolphins, and then Teddy Bruschi was like. What are you talking about? He's not even he's playing. Not even playing yeah. He's not even playing. That guy's brain must be going <laughs> no, through it. He's fried, bro. <laughs> you're all over the place, bro. <laughs> but like that, they would know that. Like, say that was you on in your interview, though. Yeah. They're going to know, like, all right, you're clearly not watching. You clearly don't use the app. You yeah. clearly don't watch first take. Mm -hmm. So don't lie. Exactly. That's what it's about. I mean, I, that's just interview interview um, Etiquette, one on one for yeah. anybody. But yeah, it's hard because it's such a, I guess, such a, a, a well known place and you're trying to stand out. So. Like, it was the same thing I was mentioning about being your own person and creating a voice. Like, you have to have, going into interviews like that or places like that, you have to have that from the beginning because that's what's going to make you stand out more than anything. They're interviewing who knows how many people on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. And I was like, yeah, I got to stand out some way for somebody to be like, yo, let's get this kid a job, you know? You know, for sure. So how long that process takes? You went from the interview. You said there was some pre uh, preliminary interviews. Yeah, yeah. You, you finally got to, you know, Connecticut. How, after that, you know, you're meeting with multiple people. What's the next step there? Do you have to wait a couple of weeks? You yeah. said one guy, why, one guy wanted you on the spot. Yeah. That didn't happen, though. But I was interviewing probably like around right before I graduated from, from college. So um, I was like, yo, whatever hits, I'm out. Like, I'm, I'm ready because I was in Boston, you know, the, the, the majority of the time. Like, but I was technically still living in Rhode Island. So it was kind of weird because I was driving back and forth from, you know, wherever game I'm at to, to Pawtucket or wherever in Rhode Island. And I'm Damn. like, yeah, so it was, it was wild. But... 
Um, yeah, I think I don't really remember when. Actually, no, I do because I had like a graduation party and I had already known at that time that I was getting it, getting into ESPN, but I hadn't told like only, I only told a few people. And like, it that, must be like on the low. Yeah, I wanted to be on the low. So it was like right around like mid May um, because yeah, it's just the funniest shit I forgot about too. Um, I my I have my commencement ceremony. I'm I'm in Boston, like super hungover. I'm just like, I don't even <laughs> want to be here. This shit is boring. Uh, Robert Kraft was our speaker, of course. So it, things just come full circle. But I'm there like half asleep, and they had like the little ticker on the bottom, like um, you could text like messages, like people could text, say, oh, congratulations to whoever, whoever. And somebody was like, uh, congratulations on ESPN, like I'm um, with my name on it. And I was like, damn, You're like damn. Yeah. I, I was like, I, I can't even break my own story. Like, this is awkward <laughs> as hell. So yeah, I found out like around mid May um, that I got accepted uh, to a role, and I graduated like May like 19th or something like that. And I was in Connecticut. I started by July, so it was super quick, man. So July, wait, so do you, you don't move to Connecticut? No, nah, I moved you straight up. I, I mean, like I said, I was just graduating. I was living here technically at my mom's. Um, um, like, but I was in college, so I was never really around. Uh, so once that happened, I was like, I I got to pack up and, and dip. I got 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 some stuff in the car and hit ninety five south and, and made it down there. Man. How's how's Connecticut to live? That shit is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that shit is terrible. Rice, uh, go out there. I was um, yeah, I used to go out there frequently and boring, bro. Yeah, that boring shit as hell. That shit is, it's not it. I, I like love to the people that I met out there and people that are from there, but it's not it. Like. We tell it's it's kind of like a little joke between people that have been at ESPN, but they call it like the bid. Like if you're at ESPN, you did a bid because it's like <laughs> being locked up. Like bro, they're getting away with crazy shit having people live in Connecticut. Like these famous ass people live in Connecticut. But why why did they pick Connecticut of all places? So the story there was the person that started ESPN was a big Huskies fan, UConn, mm. and he wanted to like broadcast those games to more people than just that were in the nation. I mean, in the region rather. So he started it. Um, over there in Bristol because they had like good signal or something like that. And it's weird when you drive up to a certain part of ESPN, which is like the highest point of the campus, there's, a, we call it a satellite, I think it's called Satellite Farm or something like that. There's all these satellites and he had one to begin and, and because of the point that it was at, it was able to broadcast things a long way. And so that's how it started. He was like, oh, this is cheap here. It's easy. It's good signal. And then it just grew from there. It started 79 and that shit is a monster since. Yeah, so it's probably just, you know, more like just a... Uh just for like the honor of yeah. being there because at this point they could easily move to LA. Yeah, well the thing about the campus is like so we, they have a LA office and it's literally like four floors and two of the floors are like servers. So it's 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 it's, it's tiny. Um and then they have now they have a, a pretty solid New York office but um and the one the campus in Connecticut is like it's almost like going to Disney World, which is funny because Disney owns ESPN for a lot of people don't know that. So there's little very um, intricate details that like Disney has that ESPN has like the campus is very nice. They have these little, you know, everywhere is decorations, but the campus that I, that ESPN headquarters is 17 buildings, bro. Like Damn. they ain't moving that shit nowhere. <laughs> like that shit is staying right where it's at. And you could get shuttled around from building to building. Like it's, it's a massive, massive. It's campus, like a college bro. campus at it's, that point. It's like a college campus. Like, and further down the road, like I, that's kind of what started burning me out. I'm like, bro, I spend too much time here. Like going to the gym on campus playing sports on campus. And I'm like, what else am I doing that's not at ESPN? Like, it's all great. And it's be being there was amazing. I'll, I'll never say it otherwise. But I'm like, yo, all I do is be on campus. And then I go to work. And I'm like, yo, I can't. I can't do this shit. And I live in Connecticut. I don't know. Yeah, that's consumed <laughs> at that point by ESPN. Hell yeah. I, I had a question because I have no idea. Can you, can like the regular person visit there? Or you have nah, to be an employee? It's a, it's a process. I got to like sign you up and then sign you in type thing. So like you got to sign people up by like a system. And then once they get approved, like then you have to go to like the welcome center, get signed in, get like a little day, temporary day badge. It's, it's a process, bro. So but yeah, you could bring guests in. Once you work there, you could bring people. Oh, that's cool. But yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you, life's consumed at ESPN at this point. Even at the Boston Globe, like it sounds like you were, you kind of, you know, preface this in the beginning of the podcast when we started, you are giving up a lot of time, your personal time, your, you know, you said missing a lot of family yeah, events. Yeah. Um, I mean, did it get away with like even dealing with like with girlfriends, people, prior relationships, yeah, and stuff yeah, like that? No, I think it was it was one of those things like I noticed it, right? Like oh, I'm taking a lot of time and 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 spending a lot of time doing things, but I always had a mentality of like it's better to do it now than do it later down the road. Like I'd rather sacrifice that I'm when I'm in my twenties, when I'm young, when I'm like hungry to get, you know, a career going, do that then than to have to do it in my forties and be like, yo, I, I can't do XYZ. So it's and it's funny because ESPN Connecticut is not that far from you know Rhode Island from Pawtucket, but I was like it's also far enough that y'all not gonna be seeing me. Yeah. Like if y'all didn't see me when I was in Boston and that was like <laughs> under an hour, like you're not really gonna be seeing me 
it, you know. And I did go back, I did come back rather a lot in the beginning. And then I was kind of just like, yo, I need to like really like hone and focus. Yeah, exactly. So like I mentioned, a lot of those holidays and stuff. And it was, I think I got lucky because I hate work, waking up early in the morning. So when I was at the interviews, I was like, bro, I need like, I want to work at nights. And when they hear that shit, they're like, word, because obviously we want young kids to work at night that are energetic about yeah. it. So all my jobs were at night. And I was like, damn. I was working two in the morning, sometimes three in the morning, like college football Saturdays when Hawaii's playing or some shit, and we're waiting for one game to finish. Like it was, you know, that shit was torture, bro. Torture. So, so you're not even going out. It's even on your nah, mind at that point. Nah. It's strictly just work. Wake up. Yeah, my days off were like Tuesday and Wednesday and shit. Like it was the one great thing that ESPN had is like they have a lot of intramural sports. So we had like basketball leagues, soccer leagues, volleyball. So. I was very, very active when I was there. Like I, I played sports all like, and I mean, it's cl- it sounds like cliche because it's ESPN, but it was dope because we got to hoop up with like famous. I, I played against Chauncey Billups one time, dog, oh, and I'm shit. like, it's crazy. Like That's people wild. would love it. Like yo, let's play, let's hoop, and I'm like, this is wild. But he probably it, went off. No, nah, he was killing us. I'm like, bro, he could have played with his eyes closed. He really <laughs> us, but bro, one time yeah. I seen a uh, LA Fitness store. Ricky Lito was there. Hooping. Torching, yeah, just torching kids. <laughs> I was like, God damn, I don't even want to. I'm waiting till he leaves because so, I'm, I'm not getting embarrassed. It's so funny because, like, people watch ball and they criticize it. I'm like, you know how good these players are, though? Like, I'm like, they're playing against the best of the best and they are the best. Yes. Like, and we're talking about them, like, bro, these guys are different. Athletes. Let's get bail. LeBron should be doing yeah. this, dude. Shut up. Them boys are You boys cannot are do a thing LeBron does. At all, even like the, you know, after being from a Boston guy, you know, the running joke is, oh, like, people can beat Scalabrini in one on one. Nah. It's like, dude. Nah. Just because he's the 15th guy on the bench. Yeah, nah. The 15th guy is killing any regular motherfucker. I'll tell you. <laughs> any motherfucker. <laughs> killing a, a G League player. He's killing yeah. a Euro League player. Never mind a random dude from Rhode Island. You're getting skunked. Yeah, nah. That's a fact. That's a fact. He's going to kick your ass <laughs> real quick. That's a but that must have been dope, though, playing against like, you no know, yeah. famous people and like that lay saw around there. But like you said, it gets to that point where it's draining you out. Nah, for sure. And you're like, all right, this is, um, you know, this game's two time consuming. Get fried out over here. So what's the next step after that? Is that leads you to find a new job or? Yeah, it got to the point that I, I spent five years, five years and a few months there. So it was a lot of time. But like I mentioned. Well, before was, you leave ESPN, was, you must have some cool stories. If you're talking about getting burned out. Yeah, I, yeah. You have a picture here. I'm going to put it up right here on the <laughs> screen. This is an ESPN like uh, yeah, thing, right? Yeah, so you're yeah, here. Yeah. Look at this. My guy, Andy yeah, with the you can you can give an explanation to this. Lord Stanley, man. The cool thing about ESPN is like you get a lot of perks, bro. Like. People like they'll bring to, they have something that's called a car wash, um, and they bring celebrities and athletes there, and they just they're on campus all day. So they have you know employees. There's like so many employees that work at that at that campus that you just kind of walk around and see people and see things. So they bring trophies, they bring events. Like it's it's the work. The culture is so unique, but it's so cool. Um, so yeah, the Stanley Cup was there one day, and I was like, bro, I'm gonna go take a picture of the Stanley Cup. Like I got to do that, and then. I went to play basketball right after that. I'll never forget. <laughs> to, I had my gym back in the car. I went across the street and whatever and changed. And that was that, dog. Like, it was it was crazy, man. ESPN is it's a hell of a place, bro. Like, obviously, a lot of people would love to work there, but it's just... The face ESPN right here for a while. Yeah, man. My guy, Stuart Scott, bro. Rest in peace. It you was, you met him a couple of times? Yeah, yeah. He was he was around, and he's, he's very, very nice, um, talkative person as he was on TV. And then when he passed away, they had a ceremony for him, and it was it was dope to be there and kind of just be around people. That's dope. Right here, me and Mr. One of many people you have met. The bus, yeah, that was that was cool. They had a NFL live segment they were doing, and they wanted employees to be in the in the audience, um, wearing you know their team gear and stuff like that. So I was on TV like three times that day. I think people were telling me. Um, on ESPN, and then after that, oh, right here, Is yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a live broadcast. Somebody sent me a screenshot of it, like they had said Bill Belichick won something, and then they they panned to me, and I was like sh- doing the Kanye shrug, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was cool because oh, so these are all workers, right? Yeah, yeah, these are all coworkers. Yeah, like all ESPN people, and it's just like things like that. You're like, oh man, that's that's a pretty dope experience. Yeah, yeah man, a lot of people can't, you know, don't have that experience. Is this also ESPN right here? Yeah, that's uh that's the hallway that leads to the cafeteria, and they change um basically depending on what's going on at that time of the year. They'll, they'll set it up to have, um, like I mentioned, the details that Disney has with like little things is very meticulous. So they'll put it, if that was before the World Cup, so they did a World Cup wall, which was a timeline. The bottom part was the first World Cup winner, and that top part was obviously that had been the last, and it was it was super dope. That's fine. Yeah, so do you have any other cool stories, ESPN? That, Man, uh... I got a lot of stories about ESPN, bro. I spent, like I said, I spent so much time there. Like um, I almost like one day I was walking to the cafeteria with my head down, obviously on my phone or some shit, and I like... 
I almost bumped into this dude and I looked up and it was Brian Dawkins. I was like, bro, if I like ran into Brian Dawkins on accident and like he <laughs> laid me out or something, that shit would have been hilarious. Cause like you just see people like all over the place. I mean, I, Drake was on campus one time and I was like, what the hell is Drake doing here? Was, like, what was he on there? He was for? promoting Kentucky thing or something. He was promoting like a FIFA at, at that time. And I'm like, bro, this shit don't even <laughs> add up. But he was just out there and it was madness. Like people were everywhere. Like I was at I was in the audience for that. Um, I was on, I was, I photo or video bombed Steve Spurrier one time in the newsroom. I just walked behind like a live hit without realizing <laughs> it. I had a Red Sox shirt on, of course. So I'm I like, think I've seen that. You have yeah, I before, think right? it's on IG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, yo, it's just like little things that happen. Like, it's just so funny, bro. But well, a lot of the stories like about playing basketball and like seeing people in the gym, like I used to work out next to Skip Bayless. Um, I, I worked out next to Jerome Bettis one time, Teddy Bruschi, like just people, and you're like, yo, this is so wild to me. Like, it just never. Like, it's so surreal, it becomes like normal. Yeah, it does. Like, it, it's almost like, because they tell you, like, obviously, you know, don't bother these people. And, like, I, I did it. I'm pretty good at, at that, like, letting them have their seats. But I'm like, Teddy Bruschi is like my favorite Patriot, bro. And I was like, yo, I used like working out next to this dude that won Super Bowls and then, you know, I loved watching. So it does. It just kind of just becomes normal. Yeah, it's nuts. I mean, um, Terry Brooks, I heard, is mad nice. Yeah, he's, uh, everybody. He's, he's a cool dude. I, I did talk to him like a few times. Like, you, I mean, having conversations with them, that's no problem. But um, like, I was never one, like, oh, let, let me grab a picture, picture or something like that. that. I, that one with Jerome Bettis is because it was a live hit and yeah. he was laughing. I went up to him and I was like, yo, like, I really, I mean, obviously, I didn't like the Steelers when, when you were playing, but I, you know, I appreciated you and, and you were you were dope. And he's a legend. So he was like, yeah, take a picture. He was laughing at my shit. That's why I took the picture. <laughs> Probably a massive, people don't understand how massive oh, football players yeah, are in person. Yeah. They're, they're, they're crazy, bro. It doesn't, oh, it don't make no sense. Speaking of Skip Bayless, though, were you there when he was at ESPN? Yeah, yeah. How there. do you feel about someone like that? I mean, even though he does get a lot of shit, to someone have that type of work ethic, how do you, like, feel about someone like that? Do you, like, I'm not sure if you like him or not, but, like, what's your work, like, do you respect his work ethic? And nah, that sure. grind is nuts. I'm sure you know it because you're seeing yeah. that firsthand. How do you feel, like, to the people who hate on skips of the world? How do you feel about, you know, what do you say about people like that? Yeah, it's, it goes to the same thing about creating your lane and creating your voice. Like, he became such a personality that, like, he you have to applaud almost what he's doing because he did that, you know, he created that. And it's funny, people talk a lot of crap about people like that, but Skip, like, off the camera is one of the nicest people at his, well, was really? one of the nicest people at his, like, he was super cool, but, like, when he's on camera, he's, like, almost trolling now. But <laughs> it's like, that's what, A, that's what's getting the ratings, and B, that's what people know him and want him to be. So it works. And I'm like, yo, he, he like, paved that lane and hit that shit running and it hasn't let up since. And, I mean, shit, the way he gets paid for it, like, I wouldn't change either, bro. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't change either. And people understand, like, to have that, to find that lane, like you said, is tough. And um, for him to do that, I mean, applaud to him because that yeah. money he's making at Fox is nuts. Nah, he, got, he, he was getting paid crazy at ESPN, and he's getting even more over there. So. Yeah, that's what's up. Good shout-out to him. So ESPN, now you finally run out ESPN. You're burnt out. So what's the next step after that? Yeah, I had I had one day that we had a meeting at ESPN, and they were kind of just switching things around, um, like, you know, through the staff and different changes in our group reorganizations. And I was like, I have had enough of this shit. Today was the day that, like, I decided I'm leaving here. Um, and I got to the point that I was like, yo, if I don't have a job by the, this was maybe like around like uh, August, September. I was like, if I don't have a job, like, by the end of the year, I might just quit this shit and like try to figure it out. I knew I would be able to have a job, but I just wanted to find something that was going to be a good move. Um, and I got, I ended up doing a few interviews um, all over the place. I was like, it was more, it wasn't even more so about leaving ESPN. It was more so about leaving like Connecticut and New England. It was like, I need to move somewhere that's going to feel different. That's going to be new people. Progress. Just progress. Your, 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 I still felt forward. like I was very home. Like yeah. if I wanted to go home, I could just hop in the whip and be there in two hours. Um, so I was just applying so, all over the place. Where do you think that comes from? So a lot of people are nervous, especially being from a small state such as yeah. Rhode Island. People have that fear of taking the next step mm -hmm. or even like, you know, one thing I always, uh, you know, appreciate about you and respect about you is I always see like your IG or your Facebook and stuff like that. You're always doing things. And a lot of people, you know, I'm out always on the go as well. Sure. And people are always like, oh, how are you doing this? My thing is, like, we just got to do it. You you're going to be, you're going to regret not doing it, like yeah. you said. So, like, what's your mindset on that? Like, when people are like, damn, man, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're going to this event, you're going to this concert. What do you say when people are always asking you those type of questions? Nah, you said the part, bro. You got to do it. I'd rather, I'd rather do it and either if it's like a big expense and worry about that later, than not do it and be like, damn, I wish I would have done it. Like, to me, it's all about the experiences. I'm like, yo, the more you think about it, the less you're going to want to. And I was like, you know, it's a short, it's a short life, right? Like you gotta, it's about making these unique experiences, about having fun. And I'm like, yo, I just want to keep building those moments. I always say, I call them moments. Now I'm like, I just want to keep building these moments that in 10, 15, 20 years, I'm gonna remember like, yo, that was dope. 
this concert was my favorite. I was at this event, you know, things like that. I'm like, I'd rather do that than be in the crib. Just like, damn, I wish I would have done this. Bro. I wish I would have done that. Like, nah, man. It's preaching to the choir. Like, to g genuine question. Yeah. Your favorite, we'll get to after, but like, whatever your favorite Kanye concert or Jay Z concert is, do you remember how much you paid? Nah, hell no. Nah. Bro, I don't remember yeah, anything. You know, you I don't remember, remember prices, yeah. bro. Nah, you don't never remember that. Don't yeah. remember prices, but I remember the, the moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember I can, the tell, I can tell you the set list of the motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I bro. Money, I don't care about that shit. I don't care because it's a funny ass quote that uh, Cody Rose said on his podcast or like some podcast I listened to about him. He said, "Spend it now, you'll make more later." Yeah, bro, yeah. fuck it. It's it is what it is, bro. My money money flows, man. That's how life keeps going. Like money's yeah. gonna be there. You gotta you gotta find it and get it. But like. These concerts and these moments and these games, like these are very unique things many times. And it's like, like I said, I'd rather have those experiences and instead of those doubts or regrets. Yes, you don't have those doubts. You don't have those regrets. You don't have that fear. So you want to get out of New England. You want to get out of ESPN. Yeah. Well, not ESPN, like you said, more right. out of New England, out of right. Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Progress your life going forward. So what is the next step after this? You're applying. You said a couple jobs. You had them in line. Yeah, I applied to places in Philly, Florida, Texas. Like, I, bro, I was, I was I was forgetting to what I was applying to because I was like, bro, anywhere, that's just something different. And then one of my uh, good coworkers at ESPN sent me this link to apply to a Yahoo Sports job. And I was like, cool, I'll apply to it. Um, ended up getting an interview. And once again, coming to, to the point of how small the, the sports media world is, the dude that ended up um, interviewing me for Yahoo used to work at ESPN, and his good friend at ESPN used to be my manager. So he reached out to her personally and was like, yo, like this kid is applying, like what do you say? And you have to, that's when it comes back to you. Like you have to be a good employee, you have to be stand out, you have to have ambition. She was one of the managers that helped me out the most because I told her I really wanted to write, and I wasn't getting writing opportunities at ESPN, and that was one thing that I really wanted to do. And she was she was the one that helped me get that opportunity at ESPN. It was a few, only a few, but she helped me do it. And I would always have conversations with her about that. So when he went, reached out to her and, you know, kind of was like, hey, like, what do you think? This and that. And she was like, yeah, like, he's great. But she she found me first and was like, hey, I need to have a conversation with you. And I was like, oh, shit, what did I do? Like, I probably, <laughs> I probably got somebody mad and said some shit. Because the thing about it is, like, it's very corporate and buttoned up. But I'm the, I'm, I'm the same person across the board. Like, you're not going to see a different Andy. Like, if you, the people that know me, I'm the same way I work that I am with my family. Like, I don't change for none of that shit. Do you think that's that can affect you? Like it could. You said and that's why I was kind of scared. She was like, I need to talk to you. And I was like, oh, I probably said something wrong to somebody and somebody got heated. But it could affect you. But, it, like, like I mentioned, if, you, if you're genuine and, and you're really your own person, I think it it's ultimately going to make you stand out the most. And even at ESPN, I would do a lot of things. Like one of the roles I had, they were like, yo, you're very, you know, um, like savvy with the social media and things like that. And they wanted me to kind of change the way like the notifications work and like use more like moments, um, like cultural pop culture and make it more hip almost to say. And so they gave me freedom to that. So I'm over here like putting hip hop lyrics and, and alerts and shit like that. I'm like, yo, if you're going to give me the lane, I'm going to turn up. Like yeah. it's that simple. So it, it could definitely hurt, like, but it, it helped me. So she found me and was like, yo, um, this is what happened. Like this guy reached out. He he wants to interview. Well, I, this was after I interviewed. Um, he was like, he's he. You basically have the job if I say like yes to him. Like he's good. Yeah. So I was like, word. And she was like, do you really want to leave here? And I'm like, yeah. Like I was. She was. Like, I'm gonna give you like two days to think about it. I'm like, I don't need two days. To think about it. Like, <laughs> I need two minutes. Hold that motherfucker back right now, bro. <laughs> but nah, it was that's how that's how it was. And like I mentioned earlier, things just lined up so quickly with everything. And and luckily, in first tries, and I didn't have to stress too much. Do you think, um, I think everything happens for a reason. For so sure, that moment, sure. when you're, do you have to keep ESPN like in the loop? Are you looking for jobs? Nah, you kind of keep that on the low? I didn't tell nobody. The funny shit, I was applying to jobs while I was in the office. I was like, <laughs> man, I was going crazy. I wasn't even doing it all. I was like in the office, like, fuck this shit. I'm applying to places. So I, I didn't really tell nobody I was interviewing or anything like that um, until I was like secure. Um, yeah, I accepted a role and I'm a dip. And and that was hard, man. It's, shout out to like my last manager. Like he, it's it, things come full circle. The last manager I had was the manager that hired me when I got into ESPN, and we ended up like having different roles, but like coming back together a few times. It was hard to tell him because I, I appreciated him obviously for giving me you know the chance in the beginning, and he always looked out for me throughout the five years I was there. But I was like, yo, you got to understand like these are the these are the situations, and this is what's happening. And he was very you know receptive to all that. So that was, and I told him I'm like I'm, I I came to you out of respect before I'm gonna tell like the other people like yo I'm putting in my two weeks type thing. He was like, no, nah, I appreciate that. So. Yeah, you know, you being professional, like you said, yeah, you know, sure. keeping it out there like that, keeping that relationship strong. You never know when you might see him down the line. You got to keep them doors open, man. ESPN is a place that a lot of people leave and a lot of people go back. So you never know in the future what could happen, man. Yeah, so how was that transition over to Yahoo Sports? So It was dope. Connecticut. I don't know for some reason why I thought you lived in New York. No, I did. Which oh, was, so, okay. so, I mean, very briefly, but 
so uh, Yahoo has a New York office and, a, and an LA office. And I think because of where I'm from, when I applied, they thought I wanted to be in the New York office. And I was like, nah, like, I'm down for California. I had never been. I didn't know shit about it. But I'm like, if I'm talking about moving. This is the move that like, is going to do it for me. Yeah, that you wanted. But I stayed. I started in New York, in the New York office, because I got the job like around late October. And I was running the New York City Marathon that year. And that was in uh, early November. And I'm like, I can't go to L.A. and come back and then go and come back. So I was like, let me just start in the New York office. I stayed there for like a little over a month. Um, just to get like get used to what was going on in in the place um, and just know how the workflow is and know the people that I'm going to be working with. And then I was like, once I ran the marathon, like a few weeks later after that, I was like, all right, I'm ready to just move to LA. So yeah, I was in New York for. for oh, like, this was recent. Nah, nah. Well, I, I, I ran that. I ran it again. Oh, okay. <laughs> but this was in 2018. So that was um, that was dope though because I, I got to I got to really see how the company worked and and I instead of you know when you're working by coastal and you're with people like you're if you you don't you might not know them so like getting to know the people that I, i'm still going to be working with in new york first was was super dope that's what's up so the transition over to la so yeah. it's, it's a different beast you don't know mm -hmm. well like anything in la so how is that transition going from espn to yahoo like what's the main differences what do you like more about the position you have now do you think it's you know that you had no fear but do you have any regrets do you like where you're at now no nah, i definitely don't have any regrets i think that I, I, it's, it's hard to because things fall in place like that. You have to just learn from it. Even if things are, I told myself, yo, if I don't like this shit, like, A, the New York office is there. So, like, I could always go back to the East Coast and be like, yo, feel like I'm back home, which if that's, you know, thing people think maybe getting homesick or whatever. But I'm like, nah, like, I gotta, I gotta go through it, man. I gotta experience it. I gotta basically suffer a little bit. And maybe, you know, things are a lot more expensive over there. So maybe be like pressed for money in the beginning. But I'm like, yo, these are all life experiences that are going to help me grow. So the transition work-wise wasn't hard at all because the roles that I, the role that I last had at ESPN and the role that I got at Yahoo were very similar. Mm. So I didn't have to really, like, I hit the ground running. And, similar, and, but now you get to post these articles right here. This yeah, is you right here, right? Yeah, Your yes, article? Sir, yes, sir. But that was the thing. And I think, once again, in the interview process, I was really open about, like, yeah, I, I do want to write. Is there an opportunity for me to do that? And they were like, yes, 100%. Like, you know, there are a lot of people that have certain roles they still do right and it's kind of like a side thing, but you know they they said that there was going to be an opportunity, and like I did in college when they gave me a little lane, I I hit that shit running, and I I never looked back, bro. Maybe wait, so question. Um, so if you're not writing in journalism, what are you doing then? So I'm technically a, a editor. I'm a senior editor, so um, I basically work with the content that our writers um publish or that writers work on. So we have you know national writers, and then we they cover certain sports, certain events. So the stuff that they do gets sent to us, and then we're the ones that like edit it. Um, we get it up on the website, we get it up on the app, and make sure the notifications go out and then like, program it on the, you know, on different uh, platforms. So it's so more like, like content distribution mm, is what I call gotcha. it. Gotcha. So like, yeah. so when Adam Scheffler's tweets are going out, just an example, I don't know if you're sure you're doing Adam Scheffler, yeah, yeah, but yeah, just yeah, the main sure. example, everyone knows who he is. Yeah. So basically he's giving the information you're putting out his exactly. tweets. Exactly. So people like, we'll have, we'll have a story like, this is what Scheffler said, this is, you know, the news right here and boom, that gets out and then that becomes a Yahoo link and. You know that's that's how we that's how we roll basically. Oh no, I did not know that. Yeah, I, I yeah. figured I knew. Obviously, Adam Schefter wasn't tweeting. It's impossible. We see him live on TV, yeah. and then his tweets coming out. I'm like, he didn't tweet that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, that's intriguing. Okay, so I thought you were look, and everyone in journalism was just yeah, nah. There's, making... there's just so much that like goes behind the scenes, like to run a site or to run like a, a app or things like that. That you know, people just have to. There's so many different roles that go into it. But the writing stuff that I do now is is like. It's not my my main job, but it's part of you know part of what I do, which is super dope. That's what's up, bro. So um, yeah. So that's where you are now. That's so that's the ending of the journey for Andy. Finally, yes, yes. for the <laughs> professional career. The long journey. Man. That, that's dope, bro. So like at this moment, so obviously you said you have to go through sacrifices when you first started up. Mm -hmm. You know, internships. You're not making money. So you know, said like historically, it's not like a you're making a lot of money, right. but. When you're working for ESPN, when you're working for Yahoo, that's when the money comes. I'm yeah, sort of assuming. Yeah. No, I mean, like ESPN was a little diff a little different because there's so many employees there, and I think that they don't they don't pay as people would uh, you know assume. But it was, I mean, at that age, I was like that shit was you know good for me. But Solid. When I got the Yahoo job, I was like shocked because obviously things are more expensive in California, but so they offer you more money. But they had given me like a price, and I like what I listed. They were like. Nah, we're going to, like, give you, like, 20000 more type shit. So. Oh, damn. So, yeah, it's cool because there is money in the field. It just depends how you go about it. And, and you know, you have to – the compensation for living in L.A. is just crazy. Yeah, of because course. L.A. is wild expensive. So you have to be able to balance those things out. But, yeah, now nah, the money's there, and that shit, you know, 
if you're doing it just for the money, then you know I, I would not recommend it. But there's ways to make money and 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 monetize a lot of you know of what you think and your creative ideas, which is super cool. Yeah, because I know a lot of people. Um, like I know some much sure of guy. If you know this guy, Omar Kelly, he um, yeah, and now he's on Undisputed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Undisputed. It's Undisputed. It's, no, on. Untru- uninterrupted, yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. uninterrupted. And no, they're doing a different type of avenue. Yeah, like yeah. when you see stuff like that, it's like so there's new ways in journalism is coming about. Are you like seeking into those type of things? It's like fire, bro. I love that shit. I love how like athletes are like using their voice and becoming like now front of the camera, front facing what they call it, and like being you know opinionated and and those type of avenues. I think are my favorite because it's 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 literally genuine people speaking from experience. Like I think one of my favorite podcasts right now is uh. Uh, all the smoke with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson because I'm like, yo, who would have thought that them two dudes that were like knuckleheads in the NBA, quote unquote, um, would have a podcast. But it's like, bro, they get the guests like Steph Curry's of the world. I mean, they had Kobe on it before he passed. And like these people are vulnerable and open because they hooped with them or like people yeah. that know them. So it's like those type of platforms are super intriguing to me. And I and I love that it's it's growing so much. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely cool. Like the uninterrupted. I like the, I, the, I like those. I like the shop with LeBron. Yeah, the those are fire. Shop is fire man. Like even the Jason and Travis Kelsey's show is yeah, pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, just doing that type of stuff is pretty dope. And um, so you never know what might you know, doors might open up for you in the Most future. Definitely. So, like, what do you have planned for the future professional lives before we get into a couple of things about your personal life? Yeah, no, I think it's it's about just the same way I was in the beginning, like, just grow skills and don't be so, like, just one lane focused, right? Like, I was, I did all different types of sports and then I did radio and then I did podcasts. So, like, I'm just trying to keep branching out and, and learn as much as I could and, and keep, you know, building my, I guess, my name up and my resume up um, because you don't know what's in the future. I mean, I think there's, the opportunities are endless, um, I think, you know, resumes are important and, and mine is, is pretty loaded, thank God. Like, so I'm like, I feel confident when I, if I want to apply to a different job that I might yeah. at least, you know, get a look or interview. So um, that type of stuff to me is like, it's, it's dope because it's, it's been a long journey, like you mentioned. And, and I think the more work you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. I still do sacrifice a lot of weekends and nights and holidays, but that we talked about earlier, like now I'm just doing what I want, man. I'm traveling places. I'm, I'm just going places and having fun. And it's like, I, I kind of struck that balance that I had been looking for for a long time. So. Nice. Yeah. Traveling places, doing events, concerts, yeah, man. getting into it. So I'm not sure if this is your first one, but a man <laughs> of many different <laughs> ventures and hobbies, uh, getting to my guy, the marathon yes, runner right yeah, here. Man. Was this your first one? That was my first half marathon ever. And I was actually in Bristol, Connecticut, man. It was it was wild. It was the first time that I ever ran 13 miles. And I was like, what? This is crazy. 13 miles for breakfast. Feels great. <laughs> Bristol Hall half marathon done. Surprisingly, it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. Check that one off the list. Mama, I made it. Yes, so it was not... We here at that moment in time, you said it wasn't as hard as you thought it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. But how did you even get into marathons? I've never ran a marathon. I am, I did track in high school football, but I was more of a sprinter. I'm yeah. not a long distance guy at all. Like the four is like the max for me. I feel you. I feel you. So how did you get into this? Were you always into marathon running? So like what even intrigued you about it? Nah, I just started running when I was like running with my cousins over here at the Blackstone Boulevard. And I was never really a runner either. Like I played soccer and I played volleyball and shit like that. But I know, like running wasn't a thing. And then like I just started picking it up with my cousins. And then I think really when I went to Boston is when it became like when I got in college, it became like more of a hobby because I used to see so many people running in Boston. I'm like, I never been around like a city that like people are just running. My, you got to remember, I was I, my school is right in downtown, right across from the Boston Common. And like that's obviously a place that people run a lot in the public garden and stuff like that. Right so, here on on Q yeah. Boston. Yeah, so I'm just like dog, like that in Boston is crazy. And then 2013 happened with the marathon bombing, and then I think that all of, all of that encompassed. And like I was like, man, like I saw how people responded to to the marathon and and you know Boston like rallying as a city. And I was like, man, that that's where I got the inspiration. Like I'm gonna start running like marathons because I saw how dope it was. And then I, I it was it was too focused. And I started using it as a reason to travel and go places. I was like, yeah, I could go here. I could run this. I could do that. Like go visit a new city type thing. So yeah, my boy is the same way. Um, episode, my server dropped or not already, but. My boy Steve said the same thing. He goes to Paris to yeah, go running. He's cool. like, "Do you make an event out of it now?" You got, you got to, bro. I'm like, yo, is, you're doing two things. You're, you're doing something fitness wise, like that is always going to benefit you. And then you're going to a place and and getting reps in, in the city, or maybe new or not. That is pretty dope to me, man. So how um, anybody who's intrigued, like someone like me, I wouldn't say I'm nervous or scared. I've been you know athlete my entire life, but someone who's not in the field at all, what would you tell them to like, you know, train? How would how would I train for a marathon? 
I'm, I mean, people work full time jobs. How do you get ready in shape to get marathon and not pass out? Yeah, it's a it's reps, man. Like it's, it's crazy. The only way to to do that is to run. Like I mean, not the only way, but like you have to you have to build up to it. It's a sport that that you can't just go into and be like, I'm gonna run 26 miles because that, that's not gonna go well for you. So <laughs> you gotta just like build them reps up and and just I tell people start slow, start somewhere that feels comfortable. And like if you say three or four miles is comfortable for you, do it multiple times. Three four miles, you know, once or twice a week. Three times a week. Once that feels comfortable, just start building it up, building it up. We call it building a base. Once you have that solid base, then you're able to to kind of increase mileage, and then you you know go about it from there. See see where your threshold is. See you know start working with different paces, your speed, and then it just keeps booming after that. And I don't mind that, Andy, but I'm nervous. I don't want to be the last person to say about people <laughs> like that. I don't want to be last. I don't want to be the last person yeah. to come by the line. What would you say swept, something like that? Getting swept up by the people. <laughs> Listen, man, I like I, I don't think I'm a fast runner. If I want to turn up and run fast, I could. But like for a long distance, I'm not like a fast, like a fast marathon runner. But yo, know, I think this is what I tell people. Like, if you're gonna run a marathon, that's 26 miles. Like, I don't give a fuck how long it takes you to run that shit. Even if you walk the motherfucker <laughs> or walk run, like 26 miles is a lot of damn Bro. ground covered. So like, yeah. I tell people don't trip on the speed, man. Like trip on the accomplishment of of completing it, of doing it, and and to me, that's that's the gratifying part. Fuck the time. Yeah, how long would it typically take, like, just the average person? I think average time is probably, like, around four and a half, so four and a half hours, like, somewhere, I think that's, like, the average, and the funniest shit, I haven't even hit that in a marathon, because, like, I got bad cramping problems. I always end up, like, my body, I sweat a lot, so I think I, like, dehydrate, and then, so I, I, my closest one was, I think I had like 450, something like that in LA, which was my best time, which I thought was dope. But yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I have, I run, I run with a lot of groups in LA and there's people that run them shits in two and a half hours. Jeez. I know people that run them shits in six, seven hours. Like all that to me is dope, but I'm like, y'all all marathon runners. Like I don't give a fuck what you're doing. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I, I, uh, I love David Goggins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, his like feats are absurd, yeah. and, but he's same way, you gotta start somewhere. You gotta, bro. You gotta, you gotta start it. somewhere. Don't they have like Ben Gay, like and like Icy Hot, like stations and stuff like that? Yeah, a BioFreeze. Shout out to BioFreeze, man. That should be changed. That should change my life in Chicago, bro. That's like mile twenty. Yeah. On on Q right here, yeah. you in Chicago? It must have been freezing in Chicago. It was cold. No, actually, it wasn't even that bad that day. That was a great. That that was one of the best weather uh, I've had for a run ever. Like wow. it was perfect, and it's tricky because that was in October. But like I think like mile twenty or twenty one, there was like a bio freeze corner that you literally just run by and people are spraying you, bro. <laughs> Life changing, bro. Life changing. <laughs> I'm like, yo, I just want to stay here for like five minutes and spray me out, bro. Yeah, listen to some uh, Kevin Hart shit. He said that he did the marathon and he didn't train. He's like, fuck it, I'll just do it. I'm in shape. He said he was cramping. He's oh, like no. bio freezing the yeah. entire time. You think you're in shape until you like eighteen miles in and you're like, bro, I'm getting my ass kicked out here, dog. <laughs> this shit don't make no goddamn sense, bro. What's your favorite, uh? Marathon that you have ran? Man, I, I just ran New York like a month ago, so that's still fresh on my mind. Um, and it was a very, very tough this race. This one right here? Yes, sir. It was a super tough race, but it was um it was uh, it was one of those experiences that like it, it kind of tells you what the marathon's about because the energy in the crowds is crazy. I went with my track club, shout out to Good Vibes. So we was out there like 40 deep. So it was just wild, wild, wild. And um uh, the the New York City Marathon is the biggest one in the world, uh, people wise. It's like fifty over fifty thousand runners, so that shit was cool. Uh, Chicago course wise, I thought was my my favorite because Chicago um, is is a super dope city and just the energy there was dope too. But New York City, man, as hard as that race is, for sure, is gonna go down as, as one of the favorites in my. Well, is that the dope picture right here? Yeah, man, it was. It's an experience, bro. New York City Marathon from the beginning to the end is an experience, bro. Yeah, New York's an experience, and the guy that everyone knows and associates with New York is jay-z <laughs> where is your jay-z fascination come from because i know you you have to be up there how many concerts <laughs> have you been to with jay-z it's like 17 jay-z concerts god damn <laughs> talk about money man i don't know how much money i spend <laughs> i go see that dude <laughs> and and the places i've seen him in is the funny shit yeah i know i've seen it earlier when i was going through I've been all stuff over, to talk about all over the map which me. one if you had this this rare one of them maybe yeah, that's on the run on the run at gillette stadium man but that I went to ask one too, but I'm not sure where you sat. I'm not sure if you're in the upper level. I had like 300 level seats. Mm. There was no audio. The up audio there. was trash up there. I went so that's the second on the run. The first on the run, I made that mistake. I sat up top and the audio was terrible. And Nothing. I was like, "Fuck this!" I went down to the bottom. Bro, that one we learned our lesson. <laughs> me too. I was like, that's "Fuck crazy. this!" That, that's a thing. But yeah, yeah. Mm. Now that I've seen, I've seen them in a lot of places in well, the states. The thing is, kind of Barclays. I went to the. I went to that's a four 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 tour at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. But I went to the actual opening. Um, when the arena opened back in like 2012, 
he did like I think seven or eight shows, like just back to back to open the arena and sold all them motherfuckers out. That's fire. And I went to like the third one, I think, like the first ever shows in that arena, and it was that shit was amazing, bro. Wait, so you went to the TD Garden and you went to Barclays for back the fourth back floor? days, bro. Back <laughs> it's to a back, back to back. I left Boston and drove to Brooklyn the next day, <laughs> dog. So <laughs> what? What made? Oh, you made in America too. Made in fire. America like three times, man. Crazy. So what made you like? You know, what sticks out with Jay-Z with you to go back to back, go to 17 different concerts. Where did that come from? Nah, I just like when I when I started listening to music, he was he was the one that was popping back in the day when I was younger. Um, and I have, I have a lot of older cousins. So they, you know, they put me on with what they listened to. And there was a lot of like New York stuff, big and, and Nas and, and, you know, the legends like that. And, and at the time, I think it was like volume two. Jay-Z came out and my cousin was just rocking that shit, just listening to it all the time. So I was always with him and I was listening to it. And then. When I grew up, I just like kept following, and I'm like, yo, this dude really, really nice. At that time, like people were like he really nice, but I was like, I, like he's really the greatest. Like what the hell? I didn't know that was gonna happen in that span, but yeah, I just really liked him from the jump. It was, it was really that simple. And then, I'm, I'm, I love concerts, bro. Like so, I was like, bro, I'm gonna go to concerts whenever I get the chance. And that shit just kept growing, and uh, shit, I don't know, man. I don't know what else to say about Hov, bro. <laughs> Whatever hasn't been said about Hov, like people sleeping because old Hov or new Hov, like. Nah, I, I think Old Hove, I'm not sure if you agree. I think Old Hove would be considered before Blueprint, like, three, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I mean, Blueprint, too. I mean, um, yeah, Blueprint. Blueprint. Not, no, no, I'm sorry. The Black double, Album. Black I, Album. I think Black, Black Album is, like, the like the, the middle. middle part, yeah. Nah, like, like middle everything old. before that's old, everything after that's like, new. Would you yeah, agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I take the Old Hove, but the thing about it is, like, to me, like, New Hove is, is dope because it's such a, a, like, a mature process. Like, people would, like, I think 444 might be one of his best albums just because of the vulnerability, the storytelling, like... And people are like, yo, we don't want to hear that shit. I'm like, bro, son is like 40 something. Like, what's he gonna talk about? Or 50 something. Now I'm like, bro, what the fuck are you gonna talk about? <laughs> like, like shit he was talking about on volume two. Like, yeah, nah, bro, people gotta evolve. And it's hard to evolve in the in front of the world. And he was able to do it in, in a fucking classy ass way. I'm like, bro, that shit is dope, bro. That shit takes yeah. a lot of talent, man. Hell yeah. Especially how his like apparently, like, you know, people say about him, he goes in just freestyles yeah, off top of the head. Legend, bro. Legend. That's wild. I can't come up with two bars. Yeah. Never mind. Uh set. No, that, well, how many albums do you have? Like, Eleven, right? Nah, he got like fifteen in the month. Fifteen, right? damn. Thirteen, fourteen. Yeah. So, what was um, was your favorite um, concert and favorite Jay Z album of all time? My favorite concert was Watch the Throne, bro. Watch <sighs> the Throne. I went to see it in Boston. Um, it was, I mean, the concert itself was was fucking incredible, but it was also on my birthday, so I was like, I was wild. And on I was, one. Yeah, I was, I was on it, and it was my birthday is right before Thanksgiving break, so I was going on Thanksgiving break after that show, like coming home for a week, so I was bugging. The show was just. Something that we, you will never see again because it's two legends just sparring, going back and forth. And, you know, Kanye's visuals are crazy. So, like, the experience was super dope. Um, so that's definitely going to always be my favorite. Um, and album for me is The Blueprint. Uh, I think I think Reasonable Doubt, because it's his first one, gets a lot of love, and it's a fucking incredible album. Uh, I think The Black Album is super dope. But for me, Blueprint was the one that, like, it took my fandom, like, to the next level when that shit came out. September 11th, it came out on the day that fucking The Twin Towers. It's just, like, the story around the blueprint how it like in the moment and how like it just birthed all these classics before and after like that shit album is to me it's flawless bro yeah it's definitely um definitely up there for me if i had to pick up uh, my favorite jay-z album like, i think it would be it would be black album i like the black album a lot that's a, that's a body of work man single but if i had to like pick any project i had to be watching the throne for me because i'm a shit. big kanye guy big jay-z guy too and just them two together it was weird i feel like when it first dropped i got a lot of like flat but some yeah. certain people they're like oh this sucks it could have been better i'm like what am i being biased here yeah. or is this shit flawless i felt the same way bro i felt the same way people were like oh this shit. i'm like bro what the fuck are y'all even <laughs> talking about man this shit is incredible incredible like, this, what? i got this shit on all max volume i'll blow the speakers out like you are <laughs> wild like, hell nah. favorite track on, on watch the throne couldn't tell me shit about watch the throne my favorite song on watch the throne it might be why i love you honestly bro that song was so fucking incredible to me just because it was sounded so different from all the other shit in the the shit hits and you're like hearing like a gospel almost like chorus and you're like what the fuck he's about to do and they just I mean them going back and forth is incredible on all them tracks but why I love you something about that song like when it comes on I'm like damn this shit feels like like the fucking white smoke is coming up and these godly <laughs> figures are just like back and forth with each other like 
I mean, uh, any Especially song in person any, too. Yeah, bro, any song in the album, like yeah, prime time, like all them shit. New Won't day, stop me. New day's up there for me. Bro, all them Love shit. new day. That's just, great, just fire. I had to buy the vinyl, bro. Actually, that, I actually have, yeah, have to. That's a classic, bro. Like, had to copy it. it. That that time will never be replicated. That type of album will never be replicated. And I don't give a fuck what anybody said. That shit could have not have been better because that shit was amazing, bro. <laughs> Big facts. How do you feel? Would you be up for a Watch the Throne two or don't touch it? Nah, nah, leave that shit alone, bro. Leave that shit alone. I, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't even want people to try it, because why would they want to try to top that shit? Like, it was so good. And I think you have to realize when it came out in 2011 or whatever, like, the moment we were in compared to now, like, the the energy around, like, projects being released like that, especially of, of duos and, like, yo, I, I still remember that was one of the most epic nights on Twitter. That shit, like, people were like, yo, is the album out? And it was, like, almost like a listening session, like, with people you don't know, because the yeah. whole timeline was just people talking about Watch the Throne. And that shit, you know... Like that type of stuff doesn't necessarily really happen no more because of streaming and the way things are. And nah, nah, they don't gotta leave that shit alone. Yeah, classic, bro. Do you uh do you agree with your uh, article you wrote on the Blueprint Three? Probably not. I think, <laughs> I, I think it's one of the worst Jay Z albums. And I probably said that shit was amazing too. I think there's like three songs on there that I like. Um, but I think that you know I, I think it's because it's whole. You look at him through a different lens and you're like, yo, just every project has to be fucking. The Black Album, Reasonable Doubt, or Blueprint. Like, nah, bro. Every album should be different. And at that time, he was experimenting with some sounds and some some different shit, trying to shift the way that, you know, the, the music was at the time. Like, I, I don't fault him for no shit like that. Wait, you think Blueprint 3 is worse than Kingdom Come? Yeah, I'm biased. Kingdom Come came out on my birthday, bro. I'm biased. <laughs> Anything that's tied to my birthday, I'm biased. About. Best album of all time. <laughs> nah, I actually like Kingdom Come. That shit was, that had some songs that I was like, this shit, I should have never seen the light of day, but... There was some joints on there, man. People just, I think people just as a project, they were like, nah, but you gotta listen. listen, listen to some of them shits, like the intro, listen to um to Lost Ones, bro. Hov was spitting some shit. I mean, Hov was always spitting some shit, but there was some joints on there that people uh overlooked for sure. The uh, Dig a Hole, that shit was oh, tough. Yeah, he dig was a Dig a Hole. Um, the, what's the other one? That Lost was, Ones. That was dipset diss, right? Yeah, that was and the sneak dissing Dipset and Cam. There was um, Lost oh, Ones. Oh, can't play that. Lost Ones is one of his. Kingdom Come was. Oh, can I play track. this? Um, Kingdom Come was the the show. Uh, the song, the single was a track. Um, 30s the new something was pretty cool. Like I mean, there was trouble. <laughs> trouble was hold on, hold on some of his best. Yeah, shit. I like Trouble. Dig a hole, and I liked randomly Hollywood. Hollywood was cool. I yeah. thought um I thought the John Legend's track was fire. Do you want to ride? I thought that was pretty cool. So like, all in all, like I think it had some joints. I just think the project was like, nah, we don't want to hear this shit from Jay Z, especially <laughs> when it came out. Like, bro, you supposed to be retired and come back with this shit? Like, nah. Bro. Do you think more people don't want to hear this shit or four for four? Bro, listen, man. If you don't like four for four, you gotta grow up. I'm looking dead into the camera. You gotta grow up, bro. Like, get get your life right. You know, mature a little bit. Leave that shit in the past. Like, he was, he was. That's whole. Like I said, that might be whole at his best, man. Like, just talking, like for real, from a heartfelt place. I think. If you don't fuck with four for four, you probably listening to some whack shit, bro. Probably more than likely. Probably listen to Lil Pump. <laughs> no, you know? no, no, this, none of the, none of the little nobodies, bro. <laughs> right? Listening to some grown motherfucker, dog. Just uh, you said no off topic. So I want your opinion. Cause talking about people not want to hear about certain people right now, and you have them on here. How do you feel about this whole Kanye drama right now? Because I think music wise, he is one of the best. He was my favorite music wise of all time. Yeah. This album. Was fire. This is yeah. any day it switches for me. Yeah. It can be either my beautiful dark twist of fantasy or life of Pablo. One on one for me. Um, this concert was crazy. I was actually in the middle of this pit. I'm like, oh yeah, TD Garden. I was here. I was probably losing my mind somewhere right here. <laughs> and um, this concert was fire. Yeah, nah, yeah, man, yeah, he's a genius. So he had always from the beginning had always had these like these fucking weird um, thoughts and shit. That's why a lot of people are surprised if you haven't like followed Kanye from the beginning. Like he's always thought a lot of the shit that he's talking about now. Yeah. It's just that he's got blown up into a different stratosphere that like anything he says is, you know, is going to be picked apart. I mean, obviously I don't agree with a lot of shit he's doing and saying, and I think it's, it's more of like, um, not having real people around him and obviously divorces and shit is tough, but just like, just, I don't know. I think he's in a, in a bad mental space and shit like that. I don't want to diagnose somebody. I'm not no doctor and like that, but um, you know, I think that people are entitled to their opinions, and uh, uh, if your shits are problematic, people are going to make sure that they let people know that your shit's problematic. So, like I said, I don't agree with a lot of shit he's doing, but you got to sometimes separate um, the art from from the artist, and I, yeah. I think that's big in sports too. Like a lot of people will say things about certain athletes. I'm like, listen, man, like I listen to music first. You know, I like people for their music. I can't say I agree with people's uh, personal views or athletes' personal views, but. I'm good at kind of separating that. Yes, as the perception around them changed, unfortunately for the worse, for sure. And 
now I'm like, I don't like to listen to a lot of his shit, like his old shit, but I'm not gonna knock it. Like one of my favorite artists, uh, one of the greatest to do it, and it's unfortunate where he's at, but yeah, he's gonna, yeah, he's gonna be a bro. Yeah, I think you said it as best as I possibly could. I'm 100 percent on that state as well, where people, um, same thing you just said, athletes. I can, I'm really good at differentiating the two. Yeah, same sure. thing with music. Like obviously, I don't agree with what he's saying. Sometimes I think he does it for marketing purposes as well. Yeah, yeah, it's new age marketing. Yeah. I just tell people all the time. I read the 50 Cent book, and he said that that whole like. Um, the graduation versus Curtis thing. Oh, that was yeah. all stage. It was, a, yeah, it, was a it was all stage. He said Connie's a marketing genius. He said yeah. he thinks everything that he, well, first of all, 50 said everything he does is for marketing. Everything Connie does is for marketing. Mm -hmm. So I think it ties in a little bit as well. Yep. But if he does really mean what he's saying, I said, I mean, I don't agree with any of it. Any of it. Right, right. But, um, you know, if I, all I can speak on is his music. I don't know Connie yeah, personally. Exactly. I don't know what that man's life is like. I don't know what he be going through. What he don't be going. Yep. Through. But I know. I know. I know that fucking graduation was phenomenal. I know college dropout was <laughs> changed the landscape of yep. the fucking world. Like that's what I, I know. Tell you that, I tell you that much. I know life. Life of Pablo's still gets played in my car to this day. My blue doctors of fantasy. To this day. To this day for me. To this day. So yeah, that's a. Uh, you know, some of my favorite artists right there. Ending it off with that Jay-Z and Kanye. This is, uh, yeah, you're big in marathons, big in Jay-Z. You're doing a whole bunch of stuff, man. And traveling. I see you travel a lot, too. Where are some of your favorite travel spots and up in this podcast? Where are you, uh, your favorite spots you've been? Any, where else you going in the future you're intrigued and interested about? Yeah, man. I just got back from Colombia a few days ago. Visiting family. Colombia is amazing. I'm, once again, biased there. But um, super beautiful country. A lot of things to do. Um other places that I've been to that I really like. I've been going to Mexico a lot more recently because it's closer to where I live now, obviously. Um, some pretty dope spots in Mexico. Cabo is super close to LA, so that's that's a pretty cool spot. You've been to Mexico City? Everyone says Mexico nah, City is fire. I was actually supposed to go to Mexico City for New Year's Eve this year. The plans ended up falling through, oh. but I hear great things about it. Yeah, same. Um, I think Montreal is one of my favorite cities in the world. Maybe because I just used to go and get like completely obliterated out there. But <laughs> that shit is fun, bro. I've never been. I've heard that. I've heard yeah. that in Toronto. It's crazy. Toronto is dope, but Toronto is very like it feels like an American city. Montreal, mm -hmm. like it feels like you in Canada for real. Um, so that shit is cool. And then I thought I went to Cuba in 2016. That was, I mean, I hear that's an experience. A lot of people's like bucket list, but yeah, I think it was like it, it fulfilled what people perceive it to be in, in a lot of different ways. So I think if people are interested in that shit. I would go because. A beautiful island to, to visit. Yeah, traveling is dope, man. I'm coming up. I'm uh, this year or next year rather. I'm trying to uh, go to places that I haven't been. So I haven't been to Europe yet. So I'm trying to do like a, far. a pretty dope uh, Euro trip. And then um, Dominican Republic haven't been there either. So I'm that's a shocker. To, I feel like you. I know. I know. And I think I'm, I'm gonna try to go to Hawaii too because I got some friends out there. So I'm trying to, you know. Hawaii is definitely dope. Kona's dope. Um, it's a nice little lot. I'm not sure you like doing hiking and stuff like that. It's no, a lot of hiking whatever, stuff like that. Whatever, whatever keeps me active, I'm with it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up, bro? Yeah, I love the traveling. I love you seeing, you know, progressing towards your goals. I love seeing it, bro. I love you coming through. We could talk for another two hours. I know you got to go. You're here for only a certain amount of time. I appreciate you allotting a slot for me to talk. And, uh, bro, we could talk for literally for hours about music, traveling. Facts. But it's got a little intro to the life of Andy. Maybe we can do a... a Online, when I have uh, the, the service, the stream yard, I have stream yard. Yeah, we can, yeah. you know, link up and talk a bit more sure. about the travel and some sure. music, the sports, come about maybe the end of the World Cup. Yeah. Football's coming up, playoffs. I know you're a big uh, football guy as well. We can get some more sessions in. Um, yeah, man, I appreciate you coming through. It's been a while since I spoke to you, and it seems like we haven't like lost a, um, a step, bro. That's what it's about. That's how you know it's just genuine, it's, it's love, and I appreciate it, man. It's always good to link up with, with people back at the crib. Time is short, but you know what I mean? It's it conversations. I got stories for days, and it's always love. Oh, man, let's do it up. Any last words? Anybody tuning into this? Anything you want to say? Any inspirations you had in your life to get you to the point where you are right now? I'm inspired by everybody, bro. It's real shit. I think I take inspiration from from everybody I know. I think you should, like good or bad. Uh, just grow from certain, you know, moments and shit like that. But be genuine, dog, and, and, and really, you know, I think my thing is, is keep a positive mindset is, there's been a lot of sh crazy shit happening in the world, and I think when bad things happen, you're reminded of like the, the joys of the world. So you should keep that that same mentality when bad shit's not happening. Like celebrate your wins, celebrate your friends, love on your friends, support your friends, shit like that. Is uh, that's I'm, I'm gonna preach that to the end of the end of the day. So that's what it's about for me. Yeah, man, that's beautiful. I love seeing you. That's, you know, handle those marathons, against the points in your career, inspiring people, bro. Because people are gonna see this. Um, you know, especially when I don't have a lot of. 
uh, athletes tuning into the podcast page, a lot of football players, and to see someone from Rhode Island do it and make it to LA, make it to New York, Connecticut, ESPN, it's definitely inspiring, bro. And I love seeing you. Though, to keep working, hope the best for you. Hope you stay in touch when I go to LA. Definitely reach out to you and visit you. Thanks. And um, yeah, man, just keep working. I love seeing you. Um, just you know, like I said before, seeing your social media, seeing you striving, bro. I love seeing that type of shit. And uh, hope you no, hope the best for you, man. Likewise, man. Keep it with the podcast, man. And I'll definitely be tapped in and keep keep doing your thing, brother. Yeah, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Make sure you follow your boy Instagram less underscore Andy. Make sure you follow the EG Pot of Thunder on all social media, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Like, subscribe, send us to the moon, baby. Make sure you follow me on Explore FF on all social media. I appreciate you coming through and good luck on your journey, baby. Let's get it. Right. <laughs> Thank you.